Good evening, and uh, thank you for joining us. My name is Kevin Mahoney. I'm the uh, interim superintendent director here at Minuteman, and I'd like to welcome you for uh, joining us to participate in another one of our sessions of, of uh, question and answers with our uh, finalists to be the uh, next uh, superintendent director here at Minuteman. Uh, tonight, we are joined by uh, Katie Whitaker, um, and she'll be uh, taking your questions and your, your comments. We'll start out, though, having uh, Katie introduce herself to you, we'll tell a little bit about her background and her interest in Minuteman. And then at that point, um, we'll go into the question and answer period, um, where uh, just raise your hand and you can unmute yourself once uh, Katie calls on you. And just, if you could just, um, uh, once you introduce yourself, perhaps your affiliation with me and then your question and comments. For those of you that don't really want to participate um, verbally, you can certainly send a question through on the chat as well. So um, we'll start out. And uh, at this point, I'd like to have uh, Katie Whitaker introduce herself to you. So Katie. Hi. Um, welcome, everybody. Thank you so much for having me and joining um, the community forum. I want to start by saying I think this process has been wonderful. I like how the Minuteman School Committee has kind of reached out and tried to include um, as many perspectives as they can and involve as many people as they can. So thank you for joining. Um, my name is Katie Whitaker. I um, have worked in vocational education in Massachusetts for 16 years I've been at Monty Tech um, in Fitchburg. My title, my current title is development coordinator. Um, don't let that terrible title fool you. It's kind of an all encompassing title. I work very closely with the superintendent in all things an assistant superintendent would do. Um, my direct supervisory experiences are all about our marketing, admissions, professional development programs. I do all of the new program development, um, the school to state liaison in terms of writing communication, fielding questions about admissions, uh, making sure our policy is updated and sent in every year. Um, if changes need to be made, we communicate those out with the different um, um, members of the school community or school school committee and um, just collect feedback that on that annually. Um, I, I'll go back in my professional career where I probably was first introduced to vocational education. I grew up in New Mexico, a small town in New Mexico. There were no vocational schools there. The only vocational or workforce training programs um, were at local community colleges. There's six community colleges in New Mexico. And there was one outside of town um, on this little highway. It was, not, it was not a big school at all and not particularly popular, um, very small campus. At one point in my career, I found myself working there as a director of student recruiting. And the only way to recruit for programs was to get to know the programs. So I spent a lot of time kind of walking back and forth across campus, talking with students, talking with instructors. And I fell in love with the vocational programs that they had there. Um, and that just made it so much easier to recruit students. Um, and then I kind of turned my attention to recruiting non-traditional students because I really saw the way a vocational training program could um, lift an economy and certainly a personal um, a personal situation. So um, my town was a very, very diverse town. There was not a lot of people who left the town to go on to college. People were born and raised and stayed in Hobbs, New Mexico um, for, for most of their lives. So recruiting these non-traditional students became something that I was passionate about and um, kind of enjoy. And I think because of the workforce training programs, I, I was able to kind of sell those programs. And we saw a lot of students um, enroll in that school. And, and just those stories that came out of that kind of motivated me to um, stay involved in, in uh, workforce training programs. Fast forward several years, I relocate to Massachusetts. I find myself, I, I had a small daughter at the time, and I decided to go back to um, school to get a master's degree in educational administration. I went to Boston College. It's a program that I loved that experience. I really I reflect back on those days and those courses often, and I think how lucky I was to participate in them and how much I learned um, through that program. 
And then right out of that program, I um, took a job at Fitchburg State um, overseeing tech prep initiatives. And that's where I kind of got hooked into the Massachusetts Vocational Network. And then soon thereafter, I was recruited by Monty Tech Superintendent to come on over and start a career, like kind of a career coach position. That didn't last too long. He had me switch over to become a grant writer. And then my title soon thereafter switched to development coordinator um, because we were planning on building out some of the programs and building new programs for the school. Um, so that's kind of what I've been doing since. And now I, I find myself kind of, and I kind of joke, I'm kind of ready to not be the girl behind the curtain anymore, helping the superintendent and all things. And it's just time. And when I started to consider whether or not I'd even apply for a job, I haven't applied for a job in years and years. Um, why would I apply for Minuteman? So I decided I would research Minuteman. Is this something I would really consider doing? I'm so comfortable at Monty Tech. And I, I, well, first of all, I just love vocational education. So I'm always so curious to see how other schools are doing it. And Minuteman's doing so much right. And it's so exciting. And I was um, reading about the academy model and different um, ways to integrate academic and vocational programs. And um, the beautiful new school and the admissions numbers that are changing based on member member communities. So there's so many things that I liked about it and ways I could see myself contributing that I thought I should absolutely apply. So I'm thrilled I did. This has been a wonderful day. I got to start my day here with some great students and now I'm here with you all. So if there are any questions, I welcome them. Hi, Beth. Hi, nice to meet you. Um, I've been participating and generally been in my car. So tonight's the first time I'm sitting still. So I'll put my video on. Nice to meet you. I'm Beth Saunders and I have a sophomore uh, at Minuteman and she's in the uh, DVC, the Design and Visual Communications Program. And we're in Arlington. So nice to meet you. Uh, I have a standard question I've been asking, but I Based on what I just heard, I'm really curious, uh, Katie, if you would talk about, you said you can really see ways that you would contribute to Minuteman. And yes, we have a beautiful new building. Yes, we have really dedicated uh, faculty. And yes, we have incredible career tracks. So how do you see yourself contributing? What do you see as room areas for growth um, and new ideas? So, um... I always have ideas, right? So if I see an empty building anywhere, I'm thinking, what can I put in that building, right? I'm always like, that's where my mind goes. Um, but before I arrived on campus today, I, I looked into your veterinary science program. It was a passion project for me back at um, Monty Tech years ago. It took me five years to take from idea, from concept to actual completion. Um, we we proposed the program, we partnered with the right people. Our students built a beautiful 7,500 square foot clinic on our campus. And now it's running beautifully with, I think 22 students in every grade level. So at its max, we have 88 students studying veterinary science right now. And um, when I saw Minutemans just getting started with their animal science program, I, I know how to help build those programs. It's something that I've done and I'm very excited about. Um, I, I have some wonderful partnerships that I've been so fortunate to establish. Um, so I'd like to share some of that with Minuteman if possible. Um, I look at my grant writing abilities and just the networking that's happened because I've been around for 16 years in vocational education. And I think, you know, how anyone with without institutional knowledge, but with a real network of support from whether it's political people or different um, agencies like MAVA, I have this support that I could kind of come in and bring to Minuteman. Um, so I think, you know, when you're thinking about new leadership in a school, somebody from the outside coming in, um, it's nice to know that I can contrib contribute with a, like a little army behind me of people that I know who I who love Minuteman, who support vocational education, who I have great relationships with. 
Um, so I, I'm sure I can contribute in that on that level too. And just as we walked around today and you see these programs and, and um, you know, we talk about skills capital grants that we've written or, you know, different ways to improve different programs. That's not to say they need improvement. They're beautiful. But every program in, in vocational education in particular needs just to stay current. And so there's always room for development improvement every year. Um, last night, for example, at Monty Tech, we hosted a program advisory committee meeting and there were 300 people in the building. And it they'll, they will have now spoken to our instructors about new technologies, new equipment, new certifications, things like that, that our instructors need to try to build into the curriculum. Those instructors will then in turn come back to me and the leadership team at Monty Tech and say, we need these additional resources. So just understanding that my role is to support and provide resources to teachers so that they can provide the best educational opportunities to your kids. Um, that's how I can contribute. Yeah. Thank you. Sure. I have a question. I'm sorry. I'm, um, have um, multiple windows open on my computer, so it's I've I've lost the lost lost track of how to virtually raise my hand. But um, I'm my name is Jenny Edgerton, and I live in Stowe, and we have two of our kids at Minuteman currently. Um, one is a junior, and actually in the first class of the animal science program. So I'm thrilled to hear you talk about that. Yeah. Um, very excited. And the other is a freshman who has just joined the multimedia engineering program. So, okay. um, and we're, we're thrilled with their experience so far at Minuteman. Um, one question I have for you is um, about once you've identified something that you feel needs to change or needs to be added, um, especially if it's something that might be a difficult change? How do you go about getting buy-in from stakeholders and all those who might be affected? Well, that depends on what we're talking about, of course, like what of what level we're talking about. Um, I, I have really enjoyed working with a team of administrators that I trust implicitly. And I have, that is not to say we agree on all things all the time, but I trust them to share ideas and collaborate with and um, any decision made in a silo is a bad decision, I think, right? And so you, if you don't have buy-in for something as simple as, I don't know, I mean, I'm going to say snow day, but that's not the right example. I'm just saying you need to have communicated your thought process with your team, first of all. Um, also, I'm not a very good secret keeper. So if there's an issue that needs to be addressed, I would like to address it before it becomes so big that it's difficult to handle. Um, if we're talking about a performance issue with an administrator, um, that's a conversation between me and the administrator. If it's a performance issue between a teacher, a, a teacher, that's a communication between the supervisor, their immediate supervisor and that teacher. And I would hope then it would elevate through the proper channels before it, before I'm anywhere near talking that. Um, I, I don't really have a specific, if I had a specific example, maybe I could get better, like, you know, saying this is exactly how I would handle it, but just know that I don't believe in making decisions alone. Um, I do think obviously there's those things where you quickly kind of make just a quick decision that may not, you may not think are going to be that big. Sometimes they escalate. You didn't see that one coming. Things happen. But for the most part, if we're talking about performance issues or, um, um, maybe a disciplinary issue or think, you know, you use, you rely on your team around you that you trust and you work well with, and you come to some sort of agreed upon resolution and you move forward with that. And, and they're not fun. Some of these things aren't fun and they're not easy to make these decisions, but if, if they're grounded in what's best for the kids. And that's one of those things everybody says, but I truly believe that, um, if it's in the best interest of kids, you have to you have to make a difficult decision sometimes. Yeah. Thank you. That's helpful. Sure.
as a reminder, people can also um, put their question or comment in the uh, in the chat if you'd uh, feel more comfortable uh, doing that. Um, but of course, please uh, indicate by raising your hand if you have a comment or a question. This is your time. Courtney, hi. Hi, um, my name is Courtney Zwern. I have um, also two um, kiddos at Minuteman this year. I see you nodding your head, Drew. Um, <laughs> my oldest here, is- well, for Drew. Oh, I thought you meant Drew. No, no, Drew. I could see Drew in the corner. Um, my oldest is a senior in multimedia who had Drew before he moved to his current position. Um, and um, like Jenny's freshman, my freshman just also chose multimedia. Um, so, um, and my seventh grader is determined to go there as well. So apparently I'm going to be at Miniman for a while. <laughs> um, but um, my question for you uh, this evening is about the fact that, um, as I'm sure you're aware, we, um, in addition to um, looking for a new permanent superintendent, we have an open position at principal uh, for next year. And um just wondering what your thoughts on what you would be looking for if you are chosen as superintendent and able to be part of the process in helping choose the next principal, uh, what you would be looking for and kind of what your, um, your understanding, your envisioning of the difference between those two roles, because I think some parents aren't very clear yeah. on. Yeah, uh, that's a good question. So um, thank you for that. So um, that was one of the things that I actually asked today when I got here. If I were selected for the position, would I be involved in the principal selection at all? And the answer was, you'd be involved as you want to be. And I would want to be involved so that we are avoiding any issue, a repeat issue of what, what we've just experienced. Also, because it's a, it's a member of the administrative team I hope to work very, very closely and well with. So, of course, I'd like to be involved in that selection process. Um, in terms of what I'd be looking for, um, there's a there's a few ways to think about this. One, what I know about education and what I know about the role of principal, and then what I don't know about Minuteman, right? So I would maybe refer back to the administrative team and say, what do you think we ought to be looking for? How, you know, what kind of qualities do you think we need to move forward with? Because I, because I know what I'm looking for. I, I want somebody with some vocational experience or just grounded in really good educational middle school, high school, high school experience. Um, somebody that comes with maybe some previous administration experience, certainly some teaching experience. Somebody that exudes passion for education and really enjoys working with students. Somebody that is very invested in whatever community they're coming from. Um, I don't, I'm not necessarily looking for a a bouncer, like somebody that's been in one place for one year and the next two years, somebody with some sort of commitment to the community that they're coming from. Um, you know, you, you really get a feel for a person when you meet them and you watch them interact with students. So I'm wondering if the selection process will be like the superintendent selection process has been involving students, just kind of watching how they interact with students would be very important to me. Um, there's just a lot of things, you know, are they a strong writer? What is their ability to communicate verbally? You know, I, there's a lot of pieces that I think are very important. And I haven't really, prior to today, given that piece a lot of thought um, because I really wasn't sure what my role would be. And, and I haven't been put in a position yet to be the person really selecting a principal. So I know who I like to work with. I know the qualities. Um, that I think make a strong principle. Um, but I would also have to reach out to the rest of the admin team and just, you know, collect their feedback as well. There, there's some people here with some wonderful institutional knowledge that they need to be relied upon, right? So um, you, you got to trust who you're working with too to give you some good information there. Thank you. You're, you're welcome. Beth? Uh, you've addressed this a little bit in answering Jenny's question and Courtney's, so I'm going to raise it up as a standalone question. Could you talk about 
your vision of the superintendent role oh, I versus that. the principal role and yeah. how you envision interacting with you know the principal, the faculty, and this and the students, if at all. I just really want to hear you talk about your view of that, right? The different as a okay, one district. Yeah. Right. So I'm really glad you asked that because that was the second half of her question that I failed to answer. Sorry. Okay. So um one school districts can be tricky because you're basically right on top of each other, right? Two strong administrators whose whose territory is what? I will tell you out of the four superintendents I've worked with at Monty Tech, two have been former principals coming right from the principal role into superintendent. And I was watching just to see if they were actually gonna act as principals or superintendents in their new superintendent role. And we were so fortunate that both of these new superintendents respected the boundaries of their job versus the principal's job. And what I mean by that is um, there are proper, proper channels of communication in a school and you don't necessarily want, even though, for example, my current principal or my current superintendent was also the principal in the same building. So imagine, you know, even parents are so comfortable calling him with or emailing him with student issues, right? Nope, he's the superintendent. So that needs to go back to the principal. He's been very mindful to make sure that he's not overstepping into her role. I've watched that for, I don't know, that's 10 years. I've watched people in from principal to superintendent roles, and they've done it very, very well. Um, I would be very mindful of that. That being said, this would be a new person too. So I think we're just figuring out each other and our roles on an administrative team. A district function is very outward facing, right? So a lot of the communication in my mind, or has a, as I've been working, is a lot of outward facing communication, workforce investment boards, chambers of commerce, um, presidents of colleges, local politicians, various town officials, those kind of communications happen from the superintendent's office, whereas a lot of school-based communication happens right from this, the principal's office. So I'd be very mindful to make sure that the proper channels are being, I don't know, adhered to, if that's the right word. Um, I really respect educators and I really respect the work that administration does. And I would be, um, I would be very cognizant of my role versus their role and just making sure that I'm there to support whatever the new principal may need in whatever capacity I can, but careful not to overstep um, because that just sends the message that maybe the principal should be undermined or it sends a message that I don't trust the principal. And that's not a message that I plan to deliver ever. Um, to my administration, to, to my administration, or to the larger educational community. Okay. It was very okay. helpful. Thank you, okay. Katie. Okay. Elise, Elisa. Hi. Yes. Hi. Um, I apologize. My lighting is like doing weird things, so I might look a little shadowy here. Um, so I am a, uh, freshman parent, um, and like many people, we were drawn to Minuteman for the hands-on experiences. Um, my child has, um, learning differences. And so, um, you know, the shops are extremely important. And I heard you talk about, um, the need to be progressive and current in the shops and, and that vision, and that's important. Yeah. We are because we're new to the school. Sometimes I I question if there's a little bit of a disconnect between the heavy focus on the vocation, which is of course again why we're here, but also sort of like carrying that into the academic piece of their days, as far as engagement and also current trends, like staying current with what's happening. So, can you speak a little bit to the current trends that you see? in the academic side of things and how you would make sure that students are just as excited and engaged to participate in their academic classes as they are in their shop weeks? Okay, so that's a good question and something that people always 
kind of bring up when they talk about vocational education. Well, that's not true. They don't always bring it up. But I do hear this from my academic coordinator a lot. We talk a lot about vocational programs and not so much about academic programs. And the fact is that I, I don't really have a great answer for you in terms of what's trending in academics other than the academy model that you guys are operating here. Um, anyway, what I've seen, the best the best model, the best example of making a vocational education relevant or making an academic education relevant is integrating it into vocational lessons, right? So like if you're learning fractions and you're building a staircase, there's what a perfect example, right? Of look, you just learned this in math class, we're using common language, you know, a, a, a shared project, something like that. And so I, I always think that at Monty Tech, but I also know that at Monty Tech, my school that I'm at now, it's a huge school and academics are on one side of the building and vocational is on the other side of the building. They don't have opportunities to collaborate as often as they should, and that's kind of disappointing. So then I look at Minuteman and the academy model and how it's intentionally designed so that shops work with one another to have common projects and academic teachers collaborate with vocational teachers to develop shared language or work on a project together. And, and that to me is exactly what you need to keep an academic um, classroom engaging and exciting because students may have chosen uh, Minuteman solely for vocational and still not, not enjoy the academic side of things. But when you're bringing those lessons, those vocational lessons that were so attractive to them in the first place into the academic classroom, um, you can't help but be a win-win there for those students. So I, I like the idea of the academy model. I like the idea of um, giving, teams, giving teachers time to collaborate, to develop more shared lessons so we can come up with more ways to um, integrate lessons, integrate academics into vocational and vice versa. Um, that's a tough question because sometimes, you know, an English class is sometimes an English class and it's not as engaged, it's just not as engaging as the carpentry class that the kid is thrilled to be in. Um, but if you can find ways to build some relevancy into that academic classroom, and I, I think you'll build some engagement. Thank you. Becky, you have a question? Hi. Um, Hi. I just want to say thank you for meeting with us all. You actually had lunch with my child this afternoon. <laughs> Which one? Which one was your Drew? child? Oh Drew. Drew was my child. I've talked about Drew all afternoon. He was fantastic. <laughs> he loved it. You were his favorite. Uh, he met somebody on Monday and he met you today. And he said to me, he's like, I really liked her. She's who I want to go with. Oh, that's um, right. Which it's is high kid. marks. High marks coming from Drew. Um, okay. I'll take My it. question is, I feel like our teachers the last couple of years haven't felt 100% supported based on what I'm hearing from them. And we've had several cases of positions that aren't being filled. We have a geometry teacher right now who is out on leave. Um, it, but no curriculum seems to be being taught when we're in these sort of transition periods. So my question for you is, do you have a plan or have you thought of plans of how we would sort of alleviate these problems for our teachers in the future. Like I know right now that geometry class is being taught by, by a teacher who is amazing. He's the athletic director. He's also another math teacher, but you know, he's got enough on his plate to have to now right. teach a, a sophomore geometry class is sort of unrealistic for him. Mm. So I can't speak to obviously very specific personnel issues. That's not, but I, but I can speak to supporting teachers. It's what I do, I think, very well at Monty Tech. Um, and that is just, that that is part of developing the relationship, right, between um, any new administrator and teachers, right? So they, they don't know who's coming through the door and they may be a little bruised from recent events. So they may be a little bit mistrustful but all I can say is consistency and being present and being positive and communicating a real genuine appreciation for the work that they do every single day. Um, I hope 
will give me some buy-in and eventually that trust will, will happen. And when that trust happens and then that collaboration happens and people start really sharing with me what they think they could do if only they had X, Y, Z, that's when we can start, you know, that's when we can start really um, working very well together. I don't think at first people will kind of come through the door and say, all right, this is what I need, you know, and they may, but what's it grounded in, right? So where is this kind of coming from? So I feel like what we need to do is really just get to know each other. I think that whole first year of look and learn, find out about those positions that you're talking about, um, learn some more why were some of these decisions made, and then again, kind of rem remembering why we're all here, what's in the best interest of kids, and then make some good solid deci decisions based on um, relationships that we're developing, the trust that's there, the communication that's there, and then whatever resources we can provide, we just we just will, right? So I think that's what kind of is the hallmark of a strong administrative team. If they really know what their people need and they advocate for them, um, you know, that's, that's great. If you don't know, if I, if, I, if I have no idea what's going on in the math department as a superintendent, um, right. <laughs> I'm assuming things are going well, right? So, right. so we need to make sure the lines of communication are open. And I think that just will come in, in time, I hope. Right. And honestly, we have the, the best teachers, I think, that we possibly could have. I've never had kids feel more supported than they do from the teachers at Minuteman. That's from kindergarten all the way up to high school. So I, I just want them to, to feel supported by the administration that they have. I would agree. I think that that's what makes a strong community, you know? Yeah. That's awesome. Great. Well, well thank you so much. Say hi. I will. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Claudia, you have a question? Hi. Hi. Good Hi. evening. Um, my name is Claudia. I'm an Arlington resident, and I have one son uh, as a junior in environmental science. Um, and I wanted um, to take uh, the opportunity to ask, um, especially you were talking about the difference in the students that are uh, coming to a vocational school. And one of the things we have, uh, at least at Middleman, um, in, and I still I still couldn't find, didn't have time to find the right number, but we have a, a high percentage. It's probably around the 40%. Somebody please tell me if I'm right or too, too far from it, of students receiving uh, special education services. So I was curious uh, if you could talk a little bit how does uh, that compare with your um, in, in, in your current district uh, where you're working? Uh, what's your experience? And if you became our superintendent, um, do you have any plans or what would be your main priorities in serving our students and um, under that need a special education and um, to help them succeed and, and both in the academic and the in the vocational. So that's a great question. Thank you for asking that. And um, I am not a special educator. And so I'm I'm not going to pretend that I am, but I work very well with some very talented special educators. You asked about our percentage. I think Minuteman's sitting at about 40, a little higher, you said 40%. Yeah. yeah. And the school I'm working with, you asked, and we're just at 30%. So a little lower. Um, your averages are higher than state averages, you know, for special ed populations at a high school. So, you know, this, this teaching staff is working well. I mean, the, the uh, success that your students are um, seeing is, is remarkable. And I think that's a, t a testament to your, your teaching staff. In terms of how I might be able to support them, um, superintendents provide resources, right? So like a school can't, be successful because you've got a great superintendent. A school is successful because people care for the people in the building, right? So it is my job to provide the resources that those teachers would need to be successful with their students. So again, trusting the professionalism and the expertise that you already have in place here at Minuteman um, is one thing, providing professional development that they may identify on their own, or I may find at a conference, or our admissions director may say, hey, we've seen a lot of 
students with uh, I don't know, autism, uh, autistic students coming in. Uh, maybe we could see some uh, an increase in professional development opportunities that might address a certain population. These are things I can do as a superintendent in terms of bringing resources in, providing them with you know training that they may need to be a little bit more successful. Um, but in terms of adapting education and providing targeted resources, um, targeted support in the classroom, that's not something that I can speak about um, intelligently, I guess, because that's just not my role. Um, but I will say what I've seen at Minute Man and what I've seen at work at Monty Tuff is um, that balance between academics and vocational um, lessons for special education students or just students who learn a little differently, it's, it's a remarkable thing to see students find their passion and then kind of translate it as best they can in an academic setting. And your students are doing well here. I mean, it's something to really be very proud of. So I think you have them in the right spot here. Yeah. Alisa, do you have another question? Hi. Yeah, hi. Um, so I'm curious um, just about maybe if you can give some specific examples of how you've um, built trust with families um, and communication and how you plan to, like, what's your vision to um, have those chains of communication um, at Miniman? Okay, so I'm a district level employee at Monty Tech. And so my communication directly with families has been pretty limited uh, just because it usually school to home comes from the principal's office. And I'm, I've always been district level um, at, at Monty Tech. But there are many opportunities I've had to work with parents and students. Um, we started, for example, summer camps. And so that kind of fell under um, my umbrella of responsibilities for a while. And it was it's been an interesting thing to watch parents kind of enroll their kids in these programs and they come in every day to pick them up and we just have really good conversations about their kids and what their experience was like and sometimes there's some behavior issues and sometimes there's some your kids not coming back to this camp because the behavior issues were so bad um but mostly those communications have been about what a great opportunity this has been for my son or daughter and how this early introduction to vocational programming has really kind of ignited a new interest in school and they're really looking forward to coming to Monty Tech and they know they need to make a certain grade and attend school and um, just be a little bit more present. Those are what you wanna hear. Those uh, where you kind of help light a fire in a student by creating little programs for students that introduce them to the bigger concept of workforce training programs. Um, in terms of also communicating, um, I oversee the marketing department at my uh, at my school. So we do all the communication on social media and things like that. Um, those are very brief snippets, but you'd be surprised how involved, I mean, may, maybe you wouldn't be surprised, but the parent group is so involved on the Facebook um, communication page that I love that we have that resource. It's immediate, it's quick, it gives good information out about the district um, in a timely manner. So that's been kind of nice. I'd maintain something like that. Uh, the school would maintain something like that. Um, and then things like presentations, right? So when you go out to towns for different um, town meetings and presentations, I've always worked very closely with the superintendent to develop all their presentations, all four of the superintendents, superintendents I've worked with. Um, so just sharing information that sends the message about the value of vocational education and specifically Minuteman, so important. Um, I, I think I really am passionate about vocational education. So for me, it's very easy to get excited about it and share all the good stories, you know? I mean, I met four kids today and I'll remember those four kids and their stories for a very long time. Um, I just enjoy my day when I'm here. So I think just putting that information out, making sure parents understand that if I were selected, the new leadership is here, doesn't plan on going anywhere, wants to be a positive force in this school, wants to respect the boundaries of the school-based employees versus the district-based employees. 
and um, support those communication efforts where I can. Um, but truly, a lot of that does come from the from the principal's office. Yep. Thank you. Sure. Courtney. Hi. Hi again. Um, so following up a little bit on Elisa's question, um, what, you know, one of the, one of the roles the superintendent might take is to attend these, um, upcoming, what will be upcoming town meeting, um, in each of the, of the member towns, um, when the budget approvals come up, right? So I sat in on one of the school committee meetings a week or so ago where they approved the budget. Um, and there was, there were definitely a handful of school committee members who expressed, um, being nervous about taking the this number, and there was a you know a substantial increase for some towns in their assessment um, to town meeting, and so I'm just wondering um, how you would handle that kind of um, potential conflict in a town you know town meeting setting, um, and arguing for you know the number that we need and and explaining it to people who aren't super happy with having to shell out more money. <laughs> Well, I understand that completely. And um, so, you know, I'm sure you know all about minimum net school spending and what's required when you're developing a budget and and um, and how the state drives a lot of that, right? So sometimes it's not just a Minuteman question or a Monty Tech question. It starts with the state formulas, right? So you have to be able to clearly, you know, first of all, you have to know what you're talking about. Like I, I will not enter a room and not know um, how the assessment was calculated for a particular town, um, the history of those assessments for a particular town, the enrollment numbers for that town, you know, going in, not armed, but prepared with the right amount of information will help those conversations along, I'm sure. Will there be difficult conversations when an assessment increases? Absolutely. If the assessment is unreasonable or not in line with their the town's school system, we could you could have an issue, right? But vocational education by its nature is much more expensive to deliver. That's that's just a fact. So you can't run a culinary arts program for the same cost that you can run an English classroom. So and we know that, but we have to be mindful in our presentation um, and respectful. Of people's dollar, you know. We also want to make sure that we're fiscally responsible with those dollars. So making sure we share out what we've accomplished with those dollars, what our student accomplishments have been, what the building accomplishments have been, um, some of our really great stories, like where are our students now, um, what are some of their great accomplishments. Those always help these conversations, I think. Um, I've had some very difficult conversations like this with our school committee members um, who say they often get questions from um, their constituents in their towns. And when we share information about how a budget is derived, how it starts with state information, and then where we build on it from there, you know, you just have to know what you're talking about. You have to advocate for your students, um, your staff, and, um, and the building needs, to be fair, the building needs. This is a gorgeous facility and every facility requires upkeep. So we'd be remiss not to prepare a budget that um, takes care of this community. So, so I just expect some difficult conversations along the way, um, but I think people know and, and maybe expect from Minuteman a, a certain output. And I think we can deliver that in a in a you know a reasonable way financially. No. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Again, for some of you who joined this late, if you want to. Uh, type the question in on the chat. We can respond to that as well. Uh, we do have a few more minutes left, so um, now might be a good opportunity if you have something on your mind that you'd like to talk to Katie about. Uh, please uh, raise your hand.
Becky, do you have a question? So thinking about the previous superintendent, not, not last year's, but the ones before, um, athletic funding has been severely lacking leading up to this, this administration, so to speak. Um, what are your thoughts on funding athletics or even clubs in general for, for teams? You know, we need money to go into athletic programs. Our programs are getting bigger and bigger and better and better. And we don't have the money to support them. We don't have JV teams, but we have this no cut policy. And so what are your thoughts on funding those types of programs? Well, that's a good question. And I don't, I don't know what the funding level looks like for athletics. That's not something I even looked at. Your son kind of hinted at this question <laughs> earlier. Yeah. Yeah. I have two so, boys and they both are big into sports. Yeah. Men, so, yeah. so um, I don't, I don't have a great answer for that. I will tell you, I, I appreciate, I, I was a high school athlete myself. I appreciate athletics. I think it's anytime you can get a kid to stay after school and do something good and healthy with some friends is the best, best use of time. So, uh, you know, I, I'd love to see the programs built out. Um, I don't know anything about a no cut policy and not having JV teams. So I, I think that's a lot of kids sitting on a sideline that, you know, aren't getting any playing time. And that's very damaging for self-esteem. I, I know that from a coaching perspective, I coached before. I, I know that from, a, from a parent perspective, how frustrating and really heartbreaking it can be when you see your kid not um, feeling successful and, and really trying so hard, but I, I need to be mindful. I, I don't want to speak too much on this because I just don't know the facts. I don't know, you know, wh what kind of funding we're talking about. I don't know if it's a lack of interested staff. I don't know if it's uh, how much money we're talking about. I, I, I don't know those answers, Becky, but I can assure you that's something that I would look into um, because Okay. You want kids to get involved in this mon in this Minuteman community, and uh, the, you know it's a pretty healthy way to, to get involved is to represent them like on a different team, or whatever. Um, and the teams honestly are becoming so much better. I mean, the Sasa team, my my older son's freshman year was like one in whatever, and this year the Sasa team won their division for the first time in fifteen years. Awesome. So there's a yeah. there's a huge swing that I think is happening in athletics at Minuteman, which is amazing. But, yeah, you know, they need new uniforms and they need the hockey team yeah. needs more ice time and the soccer team, you know, yeah. could, could use some new balls and there's no bleachers and, you know, those sort of things yes. that affect school spirit for sure. Yeah, we talked about bleachers today a couple of times and, you know, I'm hearing some plans uh, maybe in the works for addressing some of the some of the admitted uh, deficiencies on this beautiful athletic facility that's there. It's just not finished. Right. So, um, I've, I've heard a lot about some of these, you know, potential plans and, and that's kind of exciting to think about. And there's some quick fixes you can always do, you know, to like, you know, build some morale in the athletic department here and there. But, um, what I don't like, and this is what happens in some schools is that it's left to the teams to do some fundraising for some very basic things. And, you know, sometimes the teams think they need new uniforms every year. No, you don't. Like yeah. that's that's the high school in America. No, you don't. Right? right. It would be nice. There's some great uniforms out there, but they're very expensive, and you don't. So, right. so I can see where you know, I can see where there's some kids who think they may need things that that we just don't have the money for, and you just have to disappoint them. Um, but I don't like the idea of kids having to do fundraising, or even coaches having to do fundraising for things that. Maybe this the the um, athletics department should support. So it's definitely for parents. I'm doing the fundraising for the hockey team because yeah. our hockey team desperately needs ice time more than what they're getting. And so yeah. as so parents this year, we banded together and finally we're able to charge for admission for the games. We've done fundraising, just trying to get them funds so yeah. that they can get more ice. I don't care if they wear the same jerseys for the next 10 years, but they need to skate on the ice more yeah. in sure. order to be better. <laughs> Sure. Now I hear you. And that's so expensive too. So, so that's off to you, mom of the year for like yeah. <laughs> that fundraising. I know. I mean, I had a kid who played all the high school sports too. So it is something that you just kind of pick up, but I'm not sure you should have to on all things. So it's something to look into. Yeah. Thanks, okay, Becky. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Aaron, do you have a question? Oh, should I have done that one in the chat? Aaron, and then the chat. Sorry, Aaron. <laughs> 
Hi, good evening. Welcome, Katie. It's really nice to have the chance to hear from you tonight. My name is Erin Palmer. I am a parent of a sophomore in design and visual communication. We live in Acton. Um, my, the, a lot of questions have been asked, and um, I would just love to hear, you know, what would you most like us to know about you that you may or may not had have have had a chance to, you know, share enough about during your visit today. Well, I've shared a lot of things today. Um, I I I love education. I've worked in education for twenty five, at least twenty five years now, I'm from a family of educators. Um, I have great respect for teachers. Like I said earlier, I. Um, sometimes I find in my job at Monty Tech that I'm just sitting at my desk too long. And when that happens, I head right over to the vocational side of the house. And sometimes just walking into the carpentry shop makes me feel better. It smells so nice in there. And the kids are always doing a great project. And, and it just kind of reminds you when you see the kids at work um, that, you know, sometimes taking on those meetings that aren't, aren't fun, um, your work is valuable, right? So if I can contribute to make that educational setting um, uh, more aligned with like industry standards. For example, we just we just updated our welding shop at Monty Tech and it's a 60 year old building, right? So it's it's not it's not easy to, it's sometimes harder to retrofit, of, you know, to update an older building than it is just to build something new. Um, so investing $500,000 in a welding shop and really watching those teachers just get so excited with the new resources available to them is one thing. But then hearing from area employers, I called um, a local fabrication shop and I was writing a grant, this grant. And um, I said, you know, I need an employer sponsor for this. Would you be interested in just supporting our efforts to purchase new equipment? I told him what the equipment was. He said, yes, but can you do me a favor? Well, you asked them to add OSHA 10 construction, not general industry. I said, what? And he said, yes, your students are coming out with general industry and we need them to have the OSHA 10 construction. So I said, I can, I can guarantee you that will happen. Thank you so much. So I walked down the hall and I talked to the welding instructor and um, they were thrilled to have that feedback. And it's, and it's such a quick solution. And it's, it's, um, it just solves an immediate employer need. He said, every time we hire a Monty Tech kid, they're great and they know what they're doing, but I have to push pause and train them in this, offer them that training. They have to get the certification before they can come onto the shop floor and start working. So it's it's like that knowledge of um, that give and take between school and business, like what a business needs is kind of what we're here for, right? So developing partnerships with business, that's what I do. And um, so those outward facing conversations that then you turn inward and you really maybe tweak a program to just be a little bit better or a little bit more responsive to regional workforce needs. That's been something I've been, um, I'm proud to say I've been very successful with and I think I could bring to this community. Um, but all in all, I, you know, I've been very happy at Monty Tech. I feel very fortunate to have a job that I enjoy where I do feel like, you know, yes, I sit in an office and yes, I, I write a lot um, and I, I'm in a lot of meetings, but I, I feel like my contributions are seen across the school district. And we have 1,400 kids at Monty Tech. And I like to think that their programs are better because of our administration there um, and certainly because of the teachers. But you know, we do contribute on some level. So I want to bring that, bring the skill set that I do have here and apply it. Um, I don't know what else to share with you. I, I, uh, I don't know what else to say. I think that's probably it for now, Erin. I hope I've answered your question. That's terrific. Thanks, Thanks Katie. Sure. Absolutely. Okay. So is there some questions in the chat? Let's, let's do this. How do you intend to handle students who are academically gifted and in some of the highly technical shops like robotics, digital media, advanced manufacturing? Are you going to, uh, going to be given the most advanced material as they can handle or simply treated the same as students with less ability who are given easier material? 
engineering is a very complex field. It takes both hands-on learning like at Minuteman as well as theoretical learning. I'm concerned that those aiming at the best engineering schools may not be getting all the pre preparation they need to be competitive. Well, that's a great question. And I, um, I love the idea of um, looking into your engineering program and seeing kind of what the curriculum look like, looks like. But in all chapter 74 programs, you follow the state frameworks, right? So there's a whole set of frameworks that have to be um, reviewed and developed curriculum around that. And, and talented teachers everywhere look at their students' abilities and they modify those lessons, especially in vocational shops, um, to, to suit the abilities of the students in front of them. So in every shop I've ever been in, I see students working on projects over here that might be different than those working over here. And those are directed by their instructor um, or even self-directed by certain students um, based on their abilities, based on where they're at with their um, competencies. That's another word that's used in vocational education. You know, you have to kind of check off, check the boxes. What have you learned? Well, some kids just fly through some of them and some of them just takes a little bit longer and, and maybe some remediation, but they'll get there. Um, so in terms of providing different materials to different level students, I think that happens. I, I'm new to Monty, I'm new to Minuteman, but I'm sure that happens because it's a vocational setting. That's just kind of how vocational teachers tend to work. Um, I'd be surprised if it isn't. When you say engineering a complex field um, and you're concerned that those looking at engineering schools may not be um, competitive, have you have you spoken with a guidance counselor? So I would say I would suggest that first, um, or maybe even parents of former graduates of those programs, because there's some really remarkable college acceptances happening lately from vocational education, and I'm not sure that was the case 15 years ago. Um, there's a big message across the country about career technical education, um, vocational vocational education, whatever you want to call it. And the respect for that type of learning has increased substantially. Um, I hear all the time from students walking down the hall telling me, I just got into Boston College just the other day. One of our nursing students did, and I was thrilled for her. Um, they're getting into some top tier colleges. Now, our engineering students at Minuteman, I wouldn't know that. I'm sure your guidance counselors would have some great statistics for you. Um, but maybe even better is to talk to parents of former students in that program. Yeah. Can I, can I say something about that? Um, I actually am a mathematician by training. Uh, I went to Caltech and then to Harvard. And uh, engineering can be done at many levels. And uh, my concern is, uh, and I'm from Minnesota, which is heavily German and Scandinavian. And Germany and Scandinavia, I taught in a German university, respect their engineers and they take they don't call you a nerd just because you're studying engineering as they often do or used to do here in england here in new england long before nerd was considered a kind of a, a neat compliment um we, when we're trying to compete with the far east we need first rate engineers in our factories in our product product development and so on we cannot i'm, I'm going to use mean words we cannot dumb down the curriculum just because they're studying engineering and i have a great deal of concern that that is to some degree, what's going on? It may be a holdover from the past, but I don't have a lot of time. My son is going to graduate in a year and a half. I can't wait. You know, I've either got to pull him out or I have to find a better way to do this. I have talked to the guidance counselors and this oh. is an extreme concern. We're in the middle of applying to prep schools now to pull him out. And I'm being, don't spread this around, but I'm tired of hearing, oh, we can't do that. The cosmetology girls couldn't follow it. I heard that's a literal quote in a mathematics class. This to me makes me burn and mm. it really, really concerns me. I, I have a master's in education from Harvard that I got at the age of 60. And I know quite a bit about of education. My mother was a school librarian. Yeah. Um, and this New England attitude that engineers are nerds or that vocational education is only for those who are not academically talented is not only unpleasant, it is suicidal. That's not true in Japan. That's not in Korea. That's not true in China. Not, probably not true in India. We must have first-rate people. We cannot sideline them because they went to vocational education. 
that's my comment, sorry. No, thank you for the comment. I would agree um, that vocational education should be respected. And as a potential superintendent of this school, I would do my best to advocate uh, for maybe changing the narrative around vocational education in the area. Um, but I think it's happening. And I, I like to think it's happening. And I will keep contributing to that positive messaging. Um, I'm sorry that your son, son is struggling or that you're struggling in your son's placement. Um, I, I don't know. I can't speak to that specifically, but I will tell you, I do agree with you. I think um, vocational education is is uh, and can be top tier. I often refer to it as the gold standard in education in Massachusetts in high school education. I um, It should be. It's not. We're not perfect. We don't always get it right. Um, but what an opportunity for these students. Um, and I don't know any kid at age 18 that comes out ready to be a top tier engineer. But I think if they have a foundation, a proper foundation that they can get in high school, aren't they lucky? They have an advantage over many of their comprehensive district um, peers who are applying to colleges. So um, I, I like to think that we're, we're giving them a leg up in many ways, so. Thank you. So we're just after six o'clock. Does anyone else have any final thoughts or questions? Uh, We'll give it another minute. If not, we'll begin to wrap it up. Any other thoughts from anybody? Thank you. Okay. Thank you. So with that, well, um, we're seeing your thought, your comments on the chat and much appreciated. So again, thank you very much for participating in this process. Uh, many of you were able to attend all three, so that's great. We really appreciate the engagement and hope it was helpful in meeting our candidates and um, uh, follow along on the process. We we'll, should be uh, another couple of weeks before we see where we're going to be at the end of the at the end of the process. So again, I, I I do appreciate your engagement and your great questions. And um, uh, we'll wrap it up. Have a good evening. Thank you. Thank you. Good night, everybody. Bye.